Today I'm going to be sharing some tips for beginner colored pencil artists. Hi, I'm Lisa, the artist behind La Cree Fine Art. Step one, when you're getting started, start with a good reference photo. If I don't take the photo myself, I often get photos from Unsplash and Pixabay. They are royalty free, so you know you can use them in your own work, even if you're selling and making prints. So I will have links to that in the video description. It's not sponsored or anything. I don't think they sponsor videos because free service. But anyway, that is where I get a lot of photos and you can get some great inspiration if you can't come up with ideas on what to draw so much stuff there. So start with a good photo. If you have a photo where you can't see a whole lot, you're thinking, I want to draw a wolf and the wolf is a mile away. You just can't see detail. So get a good reference photo and there are plenty of resources out there for us. Next, getting your image onto your paper. You want to get an accurate drawing, trace it if you need to. If you can freehand and you like to freehand on your own, go that route, whatever you're comfortable with. There's no right or wrong in art. You're going to have people who tell you there are rights and wrongs in art. Don't listen to them. It's art. All I care about is that you create awesome work. I don't care what tools you use, as long as you're not stealing someone else's photo, obviously. But if you, whatever tools you want to use to get that on there, do you want to use a projector? Do you want to trace? Do you want to freehand? Whatever creates the good art, that's what matters. The people who try to set rules for you in art, they're... I don't know why they're trying to pass their issues off onto you, but you do whatever you enjoy. Now, what I usually will have students do to get better at drawing and improve their drawing skills is to trace things. I, let's say I give a student a rose and I have them freehand that rose 10 times. By the 11th time, hopefully there's improvement, but usually what will happen when you're just learning to draw is you're making the same mistakes again and again and again. If I have that same student trace that rose 10 times, by the 11th time, 12th time, whatever, they're going to improve. They're gonna be able to freehand that now way more accurately when they just freehanded it 10 times. Even if they just traced it five times, not even the 11 time, they could just trace it a handful of times when they start freehanding it. They're now noticing details they didn't notice before. When you trace something, it forces you to notice detail you just didn't notice. And a lot that when it comes to drawing accurately, it largely comes down to noticing detail. People think it's like this magical hand-eye coordination thing. It's not, this isn't sports. Thank God I've been hit in the face with, with softballs way too many times. They aren't so soft, by the way. I fail at sports. Anyway, it really comes down to noticing those details. So by tracing things, you start forcing your eyes to notice things that you didn't notice before. And this is gonna improve your work in the long run. So whatever method you are comfortable going with to get that artwork on the paper is fine. Trace it, projector, freehand, all, I'm, I'm good with all of it. The point is get an accurate drawing. If the drawing on your paper is not accurate before you start shading with the colored pencils, it's not gonna get better once you start with colored pencil. It's just gonna be frustrating. So accurate drawing is crazy important. When I get my initial drawing onto the paper, I usually will use a 4H graphite pencil and a very light hand. You don't wanna push hard. You just wanna barely be able to see those lines because if you push too hard or you're using a darker lead, sometimes that will show through your colored pencil not so attractive. We're trying to avoid that. So a lighter pencil is the way to go. Now, before we get into the actual video and some more tips, I do want to let you know I've made some adjustments to Patreon. Patrons who are already there know this. I have added some additional tiers, but I also wanted to improve things for everybody, even if you didn't want to join onto the, the higher tiers. There's some really good new rewards like coloring pages and cards and stickers. Anyway, moving on. For everybody now who has access to the videos, you will also have steps included photos that you can download so you know, okay, at step one, this is what my artwork should look like. By step two, before I move forward, I should be at this stage. By step three, I should be at this stage. So it should make it a lot easier for those of you who are following along. And I will be including that in all future artwork moving forward. While we're on the Patreon thing, if you are unfamiliar with Patreon for as little as $4 a month, you get access to all of my longer tutorials. There are over 300 available immediately when you sign up and a new one every single week. I work in multiple mediums. You can head over to my Patreon video library if you want to see some of the content that is available there or just go over to patreon.com slash and you can sign up now. Now this goes back to one of my original tips. You can see this is drawn really lightly and I think the camera is making it look a little bit darker than it was in person. You want to just barely be able to see your graphite lines. You want to make sure that your pencils are really sharp, not just for the tiny, tiny detail, but just for getting smooth blending. If your pencils start to get dull, even when you blend with odorless mineral spirits, which I will be doing later on here, your you'll get this grainy gritty look where bits of the white, the white bits of the paper are showing through. So a sharper pencil is going to help get that color into all those little nooks and crannies of the paper. And that will give you that smoother finish. So a really, really sharp pencil is a very big deal here.
Now, as I, I shade in the beak, when you look at it at first glance, you'll think, oh, it's just solid black, but really look at where the highlights are. You're going to see me start to introduce some violets and purple tones. It's not that the beak is actually purple, it's just that it's shiny, and so it's picking up those colors. These are the little details you wanna start paying attention to in your artwork. That way the artwork doesn't look flat. Sometimes we try to simplify things a little bit too much in the colors that we choose, and we look at something and see just black. Look at the shine, look at the highlights. Now in part, that will make a difference too, based on how large the subject is. If this bird is way off in the distance, you're probably only going to fill that in black. But when you're up close like this, you'll see more details. So I filled in the black first, and the reason that I did that, or the beak and the eye, I should say, the reason that I did that first is they are my darkest values in the entire piece. By putting in some of the darker values, it's going to make it much easier for me to judge my values in the rest of the colors as I lay them down. If, I, if you start working just against the white of the paper, it's very easy to, it feels like everything's too dark when in fact, it's not dark enough. So by putting the things in there that I knew were as dark as I could go, that makes the rest of this much easier. So I've come through with a magenta color. You may be thinking, why magenta? This guy's more of a yellow orange tone. This color is going to show up really nicely under those oranges. This will, will help me keep some of my details, but also this is going to be a lot of the shadow color. Whenever you're shading oranges and yellows, avoid using black when possible. And normally when I'm adding shadows, I, I'm, black isn't my go-to color in most cases regardless. But especially with oranges and yellows, try magenta. Magentas and purples are going to be a much better choice. You, usually I will go with magenta first, purple second. It depends on what you're working on. But in this case, I've got a lot of yellow and orange in this bird. I don't want to just jump straight to black. What would happen if I did? I'd create a very muddy end result. Because I'm using the magenta, my colors are going to be nice and rich and have a lot more depth than they otherwise would on top of not being muddy. You mix black and yellow and you've got this weird green color. It, it's not cute. Now, if you're rushing to your pencils thinking, which color is actually magenta? Any reddish purple color I call magenta. So any of those would generally be a suitable choice. Here, I've got this nice golden yellow color. Look how I can just put this right on top of the magenta. All that detail, all those darker values, when I blend this out, I'm still gonna be able to see them. If I had layered the yellow down first and then blended it, I'm really not gonna see the graphite lines where I put these feathers in very well. So by putting those shadows, that magenta in first, I can layer this right on top. And when I blend them, these colors will smudge together a little bit, but because I went with magenta versus black, they're, I'm not gonna get a muddy mess. They, the colors as they smudge a bit will look nice. Now they don't smudge that much. You're not going to completely bleed into each other like you would with let's say a watercolor pencil or an ink tense pencil, but there will be some color overlap, some smudging. And when I work in colored pencils, this is not a paint by number. Look at how I keep layering things. So I took this reddish tone and went over the shadow in the chest. There's a lot of layering involved. If you're doing this as just a paint by number, put the right color in the right place, it tends to come out looking a bit more plasticky. I want that nice soft look. On that brush, I have Mona Lisa Odorless Paint Thinner. The Gamsol will work exactly the same. You'll often hear me talk about it as being OMS or Odorless Mineral Spirits. I use those terms interchangeably, but this is what I'm going to blend with. Now, again, this doesn't blend like you would get with like a watercolor pencil or ink tense. It basically dissolves the color in place, so it doesn't smear all over the place. It's much easier, I think, to control than a watercolor would be, but this will help it to settle into those little nooks and crannies we were talking about earlier. If you've got enough layers on there and you do need a lot of layers for this to work. If you get enough layers on there, that is going to help give you a more solid color and not so much of that color like crayon look where you can see the white of the paper showing through. Now where I'm going to be doing a lot of layering or I'm blending the odorless mineral spirits on top, I am not pushing very hard with the pencil. If you push hard with the pencil, that's what we call burnishing. You're kind of jamming that pencil into the paper. You're flattening the tooth of the paper and it makes it so that you can't get additional colors to stick on top very well. They'll kind of show up, but not, not super well. So by keeping a light hand and just blending with the odorless mineral spirits, that works better. Now, if you've ever used odorless mineral spirits and you're thinking, well, it just makes my color look dull. I really didn't like the results. That happens when you don't have enough pigment on the paper. 
I will usually put three to five layers minimum of colored pencil. It can be the same color or different colors, but I'll put three to five layers before I blend with odorless mineral spirits. Then I let that dry completely. And that's important because you don't want to work over wet paper. You would damage the paper, but let it dry completely. And then I'll put another three to five layers and then blend out with OMS. And I will repeat that process until I get the richness that I'm going for. But thinking that you're just going to blend it once and it's going to be perfect, it's going to probably have a very dull look that first time through. And especially if you didn't get enough pigment on there. Here I am using my Faber-Castell Perfection Eraser. That's that ink eraser type type feel. I've got a video specifically on that. If you want to watch more on that, I'll have a card pop up, but I'm erasing areas where I want to come back through with a lighter pencil. And it's going to make that lighter color really stick where it otherwise wouldn't. This eraser is an absolute must have for me with colored pencil. And when you do the, use that eraser, don't push it too hard and don't work that over paper that's still wet from OMS. You will just, you'll rip hole right through that paper. The paper that I'm using is a hot press watercolor paper. This one is by Arches. It's smooth, but it has enough tooth that the pencil really sticks well to it. So now I'm coming through. This is a color called, and I always pronounce this wrong. I call it Kaput Mortem. If you've been around for very long, you're just used to me mispronouncing stuff. But this color is one of the pencils. It's from Polychromos. And I use that more, it's pretty much used in every single piece that I do. It's just this really nice brownish red tone, a very natural look. And so I'm using this for some of those darker shadows. A lot of the shadows that you're seeing me go through too with the feathers where it's really dark, it almost looks black. I'm actually using a color called Nightshade. That one is a Derwent Lightfast color. That's another must have color for me, but it's a deep dark purple color. And the cool thing there is with the Derwent Lightfast, there are purples that are Lightfast that I can't find in any other brand. They are just amazing colors really deep, really re rich, and it's going to look darker than if you had just used a black pencil. Here is the Derwent Girl in Chinese White. Any opaque white would work for this, but see how it'll show up really well over the areas that I had erased with that Faber-Castell Perfection Eraser. A normal eraser isn't going to work very well. It sort of gums up with a colored pencil. It's not super effective, so that's why I go with that, that Faber-Castell Ink Eraser. It's more gritty. I say ink eraser. It's not called an ink eraser. It's just their Faber-Castell Perfection Eraser, but it's like a, a rough ink type feel. A lot of people compared it to the old typewriter erasers. But unlike the use for typewriter, this actually is effective. So I'm going to sketch in the toes here so I don't blend over them with the branch. I'm going to go with a solid tan color, which is fill that branch in completely. I'm being pretty messy here with my colors. I'm not, not, you can see my pencil strokes all over the place. I actually want a bit of texture looking, look in this branch. So that's part of why I'm being messy. The other part is that these are the Derwent Lightfast pencils. And I know these blend really smooth with the odorless mineral spirits. So even if I did want that very smooth, it would blend out. But the reality here is I'm going for a little bit of texture in a very sloppy manner. There I'm using both violet and then the darker color I used was some of the Derwent, uh, what was that? The Lightfast Nightshade color. So I blended that with Odorless Mineral Spirits. Nice and messy, so I get that texture. I'm going to let that dry completely. Coming on to the bird's tail, I added white first where I want that yellowish tone. And what that's going to do, it's, a, it's my Derwent Drawing Chinese White, so it's the more opaque and it's a waxy pencil. So when I go over it with color and I blend that out, watch what happens when I go over with the Odorless Mineral Spirits. That white, stay, it really protects the paper very well. So it keeps me from going too dark when I smudge color over it. Same thing, using my purple tones here. Using a combination, I lined it with the nightshade and now I'm going over with greens. We've got yellow right over that white. And the beginning stages look kind of like something you drew with your feet. You wanna keep layering until it looks good. And if you've been using a light hand throughout the entire drawing, just lots of layers with a very light hand, your paper is going to be able to keep taking more layers. Now it does depend on the type of paper you're using. If you're using like a, a Bristol vellum, that's you're limited on the, the layers you can take. But if you're using a hot press watercolor paper, a, a good one like I'm using here, you can do a lot of layers. Just don't push too hard. Anywhere where I pushed hard, now going back, I actually should back that up a little bit. I did push hard where I put the white on the tip of the, the feathers because I want that to stay really bold. But everywhere else I'm using a light hand. If you use a light hand, you didn't push too hard, you can keep layering on top of layering to a pretty good extent. With colored pencils, you will hit a point where you can't get more layers. 
That's why we want to keep a light hand. But if you aren't pushing too hard, you're going to be able to do, you, you can get a whole lot of layers on there. I would say on average, most of my drawings have maybe 15 to 20 layers. I'm using the polychromos white there because it's, it's not as opaque and I just want to lighten the color a little bit without it being too bright. If I use one of my more opaque whites, let's say the Caran d'Ache Luminance White, which is a more wax-based pencil or the one I'm using here, that is the Derwent Drawing Chinese White. They're so opaque. So that's why on just those edges where I wanted them lighter without being too white, that's where I went over to the polychromos white because that is being a, a more oil-based pencil, has a it's more translucent. We'll get some darker areas in here, just some final touch-ups. Now you'll often hear me talk about a pencil being wax or oil-based. They're all a combination of wax, oil, clay, some other ingredients. When we talk about something being wax or oil, we're mainly talking about in practice. If it has a higher oil content, it tends to be more translucent. The lead is, is more firm. So like here, I want a really sharp point, lots of detail. I'm gonna go with my polychromos, higher oil content. I'm gonna get finer detail where I want something to be more opaque, that is a higher wax-based content, and that pencil would be like the Caran d'Ache Luminance, your Prismacolors, or the Derwent, uh, I'm trying to think which other ones, the Derwent uh, Drawing Pencils. Although the Derwent Light Fast Pencils, they're listed as an oil-based pencil. To me, in practice, they feel somewhere in between an oil. They're a really good balance between oil and wax. They're, those ones are fairly opaque too. So they kind of break that rule of the higher oil or wax content being more opaque because they're somewhere in the middle, but they're one of the more opaque pencils because that didn't just confuse anybody. Some final details there, the edges of the feather. See how I just keep layering until it looks good. Those initial layers, they really look like something that I drew with my feet. But as I continue moving through this and layer on top of layer, we can get something far more detailed. So there is our finished scream chicken. Any of you own Sun Conyers? You know what I'm talking about, but there he is all finished. I'm currently working on a more advanced version of this same drawing, so you can follow along with that over on Patreon. I will, within the next couple of weeks, have that tutorial here for free over on, well, the, the sped up version here on YouTube. And of course, we've got the real-time version of this if you wanted to follow along step-by-step. Step. That is over available on Patreon now. Link is in the video description. Oh my gosh, Sushi, yes, I know, you're a scream chicken too. Have you subscribed yet? If not, I have a handy button right there. It's around, has an orange arrow going towards it. If you click on that, YouTube may or may not notify you when new content goes up. So just know that I have new videos every Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. And of course, a new Patreon video every Tuesday night. Wednesday morning, depends on what time I get that uploaded.